what I want to talk about is really the journey to writing this book about these objects. And really, it's a journey about <coughs> me, and it's a journey about touch, and it's a journey about trying to take on the world in the way that I know. Um, and that's a world which, in which place and objects are very, very important. Um, it's a story, I don't know how many of you, well, some of you obviously have read it because you're here. <laughs> <laughs> a stupid thing to say. Um, it's a book about netsuke. Now, netsuke are very small, they're not that big. And I bought some. Um, and the doors are going to be locked, but <laughs> can you pass these round? Could someone take one to the very back? Um, there are... I, I'm, I'm, can you pass them round? I, I, no one is leaving without my three, uh, with my three Netsuke. I need them back. <laughs> They've been through quite a lot. There are three Netsuke. There is one from 1770 of two, a walnut shell. Uh, there's one of a no dancer by one of the greatest Netsuke people from 1800. And there's a mask that my grandmother used to play with in Vienna, which is her favorite Netsuke of all. And there's no ivory ones, because they get confiscated by customs, if you bring them through customs. <laughs> but there, they work in the hand. And I wanted you to have that, as I'm talking to you, about objects and survival and touch. And really, also trying to navigate my journey from Paris to Vienna to Tokyo to Tunbridge Wells to my life in London and through lots of complicated places. But as I say in the book, right at the very end of this book, I end up by mistake really in Odessa, which is the place that my ridiculously, ridiculously oligarchically rich Jewish family shipped out from in the 1850s. And I'm there with my brother and I find myself in a, in, a, in, a, in a cafe with a, a, um, a Ukrainian academic who is very fierce, very alarming, and he says, what, what are you doing here? What are you writing about? And I say, well, I think I'm here because... And then I stumble, and I come to a halt, and I say, I, I think I'm writing a book about myself, but it might be about memory. Uh, it might be about place, or it may even be about Japanese objects, but I don't know anymore which is a really bad sell for the book, because I still don't know what the book's about. But it is about some of those things. But what I do know about is it's about these things which are going round. And it's about place. And the story starts here, in Paris, in the 1870s. If you look up there, there's a very sophisticated thing here, which I won't be able to do. But the Parc Monceau, if you look up and see the Parc Monceau there, um, the... The, the, and in, near the Pont Monceau is the Rue de Monceau, with this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful hill of golden buildings. And my Jewish family, the Frissi, they decided that they were going to do an, a, a Rothschild. They were going to send their, their Jewish boys out from Odessa and they were going to marry good Jewish girls. And it was all going to be hugely golden and dynastic. And so some of the family were sent to Paris and they were sent to this building in the 1860s, 1870, and they built this, the Hotel Efrussi, and there were three boys who were sent to Paris. There was Jules, who was the, the kind of, the, the good financier who married the right Jewish girl, richer than him, you know, really good. And then there was the second boy, um, Ignace, who was the, the playboy and got into scrapes and was a jeweler and loved horses, loved horses racing, and, 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 and he's endlessly getting into terrible, terrible problems, and you kind of tracked him through the social columns, so little social, little writs about little problems with his life. And the third boy, the third boy is Charles, and he is, he's, he's the spare son, and he, his apartment is at the top, and you have to imagine being 21 with an empty apartment in Paris, and ridiculously rich, and he loved art. And so, what do you do if you're that kind of boy with that kind of life? Well, I 
found it very difficult to get into, into, into making a relationship with this man, but I found this in the Louvre. I spent a ridiculous amount of time in the archives of the Louvre. This is a dinner party invitation of Charles's, and a third of the people here are artists, and a third of them are poets, and a third of them are men of the world, mundane. And that's the texture of his world, that kind of thing, art, literature, and society. And here he is walking down the room also in his top hat um, with his Jules Laforgue, his, 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 his secretary walking in front of him. And we know him and we know what he looks like because here he is in the back of his friend Renoir's painting. I can't do the pointer, but you can see him talking to Jules. And there he is with his reddish beard that my grandmother remembers so well. And what does he do? Well, he's part of this society with this empty apartment. And so he starts going shopping. And he buys amazing, amazing Renaissance tapestries. He buys a Medici bed. And he unpicks the M and puts the E for a frissy. <laughs> which tells you about bling in a way that even you in Ireland can't understand. And he buys a, 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 a gobelin... Uh, um, um, Savonnerie uh, um, carpet of the Golden Wings, which was made for the Louvre, and he cuts it down to size <laughs> to fit his new apartment. And then he starts to write about art, and he starts to write for the Gazette de Beaux Arts, and then he becomes, and then he buys it because he's <laughs> because that's what you do. And he starts he starts to collect. He starts to collect with passion. He collects Monet. This is at the National Gallery. I've taken my children to see this and said, this, darlings, is not part of your inheritance. <laughs> and he, he buys Monet and he buys Renoir, this beautiful, beautiful picture of a gypsy girl. He buys Renoir, seriously, this is in Chicago. This is, uh, uh, he buys Sisley, he buys Manet, this is in Met. He buys Bert Morisot, and he writes about them. He writes about these people because he cares about them. It's not just a rich young man buying art. For, 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 for an empty... It becomes who he is. He becomes a writer and an animator of art. And that's the crucial thing. And I realised that I loved him um, after far too long. I thought I could knock this book off in six months. And six months later, I was still in the archives. And a year and a half later, I was, um, when I found this wonderful letter, which is from Puvis de Chavan, the great Impressionist painter, which is to Charles's dog, Carmen. <laughs> and it go, how wonderful to have a dog called Carmen in Belle Epoque, Paris. I mean, you have to be very kind of particular. Imagine that dog walking down the street. Um, but then the letter says to, to Carmen, my dear Carmen, tell your wretched owner to write back to me. <laughs> and he's generous. He buys this bundle of asparagus and the artist, who you know, says it's 800 francs, but Charles sends him 1,000, and then on Tuesday gets back that, with a note <laughs> saying, this one has slipped from the bundle. <laughs> but he's a man of the world, and his taste changes, and he buys Gustave Moreau, and he falls in love with this remarkable, it's his mistress, Louise Candavour, and they have a child, which is quite complicated. But he also, um, and they start buying Japanese art together, because Japanese art is the thing that happens in Paris in the 1870s and 80s, and that's what you do. Collection of Monsieur Charles Effrissy. They buy lacquer together. And what else do they buy? Well, while the horse racing brother is running horses in his racing colours out at Longchamp, and the aunt is buying and making this little country retreat in Cap Ferrat. What does Charles do? He buys Netsuke. He buys 264 of them, a fox with inlaid eyes in wood, a curled snake on a lotus leaf in ivory, a boxwood hair and the moon, a standing warrior, a sleeping servant, children playing with masks in ivory, children playing with puppies, dozens of ivory rats, monkeys and tigers, and eels and a galloping horse, and priests and actors and samurai and craftsmen and a bathing woman in her wooden tub, and a bundle of kindling tied up in a rope. 
a meddler, a hornet on a hornet's nest, three toads on a leaf, a couple making love, a reclining stag scratching his ear with a hind leg. An octopus, a naked woman, an octopus, a naked woman, three sweet chestnuts, a priest on a horse, a persimmon, and over 200 more, a huge collection of very small things. Charles brought them not piece by piece like his lacquers, but as a complete and spectacular collection from his dealer, Seychelles. Had they just come in, each one folded in its square of silk, then placed in wood shavings, then crated from Yokohama on one of those four-month shipments by way of the Cape. Had Seychell recently put them out in a cabinet to tempt his rich collectors, or did Charles unwrap them one by one, finding my favorite tiger turning in surprise on a branch of bamboo, or the rats looking up as they are caught on the dried up husk of a fish? Did he fall in love with the startlingly pale hair with amber eyes and buy the rest for company? I, I don't know, he bought them. He bought this incredible collection and he buys them and you've got one in your hands, I hope, because they are the kind of thing you want to pass on. That's what you're doing. You want to have it in your hands. Sorry, I need to have one here for you as well. And pass it on because that's the point. They, they animate and they bring conversation to the fore. They make conversation happening. And that's why he buys them. And that's how they come into this family conversation. But, but Charles lives in Paris. It's the Belle Epoque. And he gets grand. And he starts buying grander things. He buys this, which is now in the Getty. And I went to the Getty and I said... As a joke, at a lecture there, I've come to take this home. <laughs> and they really didn't think it was funny <laughs> at all. And he buys grander things, and he moves to a bigger house. And Charles, the man who I actually grew really to love, decides in 1899 that there's no room in his house for this vitrine of these small, strange, funny, erotic, delightful, quixotic, complicated things anymore. And so, in 1899, he decides to give them away. And he gives them to the second branch of the family. Remember this great, wonderful sweeping out of family, one lot to Paris, one lot has gone to Vienna. And they've gone, I love maps, um, um, they've gone to Vienna, to the Ringstrasse, and they have built themselves a family house. <laughs> so this is where my father grows up. The Palais Ephrasi, bigger than the Hotel Ephrasi by a mile. And it's a dreadful, dreadful place. It's dreadful, it's golden, it's marble, it's full of, I find it very, very complicated as a place to be in. It's, 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 every ceiling is painted and gilded. You can't move for, 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 for putty. <laughs> but it's also the house of a Jewish family who have arrived in Austria uh, and are no longer wandering Jews. They've decided to stay put. And it's a very interesting house, and I'm very, very, very... That's one of my things, is place. And it took me a long time in this house to work out when I was in this ballroom, which is the only room in the house that Gentile families in Fadersiecle, Vienna, would ever come. The, the, the pictures on that ceiling are Esther being crowned as Queen of Israel, and Hammam being destroyed, the enemy of the Jews being destroyed. So you go into this ballroom in this mad house, and you look up or you don't look up, but there are very specific images of Zion on the gilded ceilings, as well as endless pictures of people playing harps. <laughs> and Charles, Charles, cousin Charles, sends his cousin Victor, my great-grandfather, as a wedding present, in 1899, Victor is marrying the girl from the palais next door. Uh, um, he's marrying 
Emmy, my great-grandmother, who is ridiculously young and not in love with him, and she loves dressing up. She loves, she really loves dressing up. <laughs> and she loves dancing, and she loves hats. <laughs> and she has lovers. This is one of her lovers, who's an archduke, caught in the street, an amazing picture that I found tucked into a book of my grandmother's. Uh, why it was there, I don't know. And into that house, which is full of 60 years of good European shopping, there's no room for, for this vitrine, and so the vitrine of Netsuke end up in her dressing room. And they end up, this is the view from her dressing room over to the Votivkirche across the Ringstrasse. And that matters because that's the room. That's the room in which she is alive. That's the room in which she sheds her clothes and takes on the clothes for the next thing she has to do. And that's the place that actually suddenly I have real oral history because that's the place where my grandmother, here she is on their train going off to their country house, there she is with her sister. That's the place where these children play with the Netsuke. There they go because that's the one time that they see their mother in this house full of servants they go for an hour in the evening as their mother is being dressed by their maid, Anna, her maid Anna. And then the great vitrine is opened up. The children in the dressing room choose their favorite carvings and play with it on the pale yellow carpet. Gisela, who I'd say was very beautiful, loved the Japanese dancer holding her hand, her fan against the brocade gown caught in mid-step. Iggy, who's the young boy, my great uncle, Loved the wolf, a tight, dark tangle of limbs, faint markings all along its flanks. And he loved the bundle of kindling tied up with a rope. There's a dried fish, and there's the mad old man with his bony back. And Elizabeth, contrary, loved the mask with its abstracted memory of faces, which I hope is here somewhere. You can arrange these carvings, ivory and wood, all the 14 rats in one long row, the three tigers, the beggars over there, the children, the masks, the shells, the fruits. You can arrange them by color, all the way from the dark brown meddler to the gleaming ivory deer, all by size. The smallest is the single rat with black inlaid eyes chewing his tail, little bigger than the magenta stamp issued to celebrate the 60th year of the emperor's reign. Or you muddle them up so that your sister can't find the girl in her robes or you stockade the dog and her puppies, and they have to get out. Because this is the great thing, is that these things, these beautiful objects, suddenly become toys. They cease to be kind of objects of kind of conversation in a drawing room and become toys. And that's the point of them. That's the point of them. And so they have this second life not in Vienna, but in Paris. Not in Paris, but in Vienna. And they're part of this extraordinary assimilated Jewish life where you go constantly to the theater and the opera. This is my grandmother's opera book for 1916. And look what they go to, <coughs> Mama and Papa and all those cousins, all those Jewish cousins, uh, stories one after another about all of these people. And that's, that's what happens. Because this is what happens if you live in this place, in Vienna, in the greatest, most civilized city in Europe at the turn of the 20th century. And my grandmother got away. She became a poet. She became a lawyer. She got to university. And Iggy, who I loved, there he is, rather stout already, uh, who was gay and didn't want to be the next banker in this dreadful, dreadful dynasty, runs away and becomes a dreadful fashion designer. <laughs> really, really bad. <laughs> but my God, he loves fashion. And he, I, when, the book, when this book came out and I suddenly had to talk in public, it's the very, very first time I bought myself a suit my first suit, which is this suit. And I thought of Iggy, and I thought, 
that the Baron, I, Leo Efrissi, would be so happy that finally I was well-dressed enough to go out in public after all those years of making pots that no one wanted. <laughs> and the problem for me, the problem for me about writing this book was that once I decided that in some way I had to write this book, and I have to hurry, I've lost my head. I'm okay for time, aren't I? Yeah. Is that Okay. Okay, I think that's yes, fine. <laughs> and the problem, of course, for me is that I knew what was going to happen because, uh, uh, because, of, because of this, because of the Anschluss, because of the fact that I'd heard both from my grandmother and from Iggy, um, both of them in their 80s, about what happened in 1938. Um, and the, the fact that, that when, the, when, when the first tanks crossed over from Germany into Austria that, that, very, that very night that the, the, the uh, palais was, was, was broken into and that my great-grandfather and great-grandmother were, were, were beaten up and, and robbed um, and that uh, um, and that that was the beginning of 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 something which is is irreducibly difficult to talk about because it matters and to screw it up is an offence. So how can you write about this particular period of time uh, when my 78-year-old grandfather was made to dig a trench outside his family house? and when his shovel breaks, was forced to dig with her hands, and my great-grandmother, in her 50s, uh, was forced to, to scrub the street in front of the house. And the house is taken apart, um, and very carefully, very methodically, by the Gestapo, uh, and by neighbours. And it's aerianised, and the fortune goes, and the bank is signed away, and they are stuck. They're stuck in Vienna. And my grandmother comes back and, and she gets them moving and she gets them out of Vienna. And she gets them to their house in Czechoslovakia where my great-grandmother commits suicide in 1938. Um, and... You know what? I love archives. I really, really love archives, and I really love research, and that matters to me. And this is a book which is built on encounter with real things. But when you are in archives and it all goes wrong is when you're in archives where Eichmann has been before and where you find the gaps in the history and you're looking for cousins and you can't find them. It's difficult, and it's very difficult to write about with conviction, but without that kind of emotion which means it's unreadable, so it's difficult. And that's the moment when I had to work out whether I could actually finish this book or not. What happens is that my, 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 is that my Victor is a refugee. He comes to England, he comes to Tunbridge Wells, of all wonderful, pathetic places to come to. And with my father, as a nine-year-old boy, and my grandmother. And Iggy, in America, joins the American army, and he fights his way across Europe. And here he is in the Normandy landings, and he's named his jeep after his sister. And in 1945, my grandmother goes back to Vienna to find out what's happened. And do you know what? I can't tell you the story about what happens, because that's just too much. But... In 1945, she gets the Netscape back. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you the story because that's just, that's just tough. You know, I don't see why I have to. <laughs> but Iggy sees the Netscape and he doesn't know what to do with his life. He's demobbed. He can't live in Europe. He can't go back to America. And he sees this jumble of Netscape, which are his childhood which are the thing that has left. And he says, I know what I'm going to do with them. I'm going to take them back. 
So he takes them to Tokyo. And here he is at Haneda Airport in 1947. And in Japan, he gives parties and he builds a house. And in this house, which he has with his partner, Jiro, this lovely Japanese man, who's now in his late 80s, he builds a vitrine. There's lots and lots of fraternization here. Japanese and American and European friends. Sushi and beer served by Mrs. Kanako. It's Liberty Hall. It's a house with panache, none of the clutter of his childhood in that palais. It's a dramatic interior of gold screens and scrolls, paintings and Chinese pots, created as a new home for the Netsuke, for right in the center of this house, in the center of Iggy's life, are the Netsuke. Iggy designed a glass case for them. It has patterned papers on the wall, not only are the 264 Netsuke back in Japan, but they're back on show in a salon, placed by Iggy, hidden lights at dusk. The vitrine glows with all the gradations of cream, bone, and ivory. At night, they can light the whole room again. Here, the Netsuke become Japanese again. They lose their strangeness. They are surprisingly accurate renditions of the food you eat, clams, octopus, peaches, persimmon, bamboo sheets. The bundle of kindling that is kept by the kitchen door is knotted like this Netsuke by Sokol. The slow, emphatic turtles climbing over each other on the edge of the temple pond are your tomokatsu Netsuke. And you are not perhaps meeting monks and peddlers and fishermen let alone tigers on the way to your office in Maranucci. But the man at the noodle stand at the train station has the same permanent scowl as the disappointed rat catcher. I was 17 when I first went to Japan, 17 when I first saw these Netsuke, 17 when I first was told that there was a story I was 28 when I went to live in Tokyo to write a book. And I used to spend my afternoons with, with Iggy, who was at that liminal point when he wanted to talk. And was told what had happened. And being given the Netsuke, is of course being given a responsibility and it's taken me a very, very long time to work out whether that responsibility to look after the memory of this man, and here is his grave, which I was in this beautiful Tokyo temple cemetery. I was there in December cleaning his grave. It uh, was also a responsibility to, to, to work out what to do with this story and it, it was a responsibility I tried very, very, very hard to avoid. It, there's a problem about telling stories and there's a problem about writing stories and one of my problems, of course, was having started this wretched, wretched, wretched story was actually how on earth I was ever going to get my life back and finish this book. I have children, I have a marriage, I'm also a potter. And so I took myself as I said, to Odessa, to see whether I could find a way of finishing the story. And of course I couldn't. I was there in this beautiful place. And because by now you probably got the sense of the picture, the first house is the banking hall, the second part is the merchant's thing, and the third house is the Afrisi Palais. <laughs> and there I was with my brother, and it was all beautiful. And I said, let's, that's fine, that's fine, that's great. But we went round the back. And for some reason, there was a two de chevaux up on, up on concrete. How on earth was a 2CV in Odessa? And there was a train down station, and there were lots of 
rather scary Ukrainian workmen, and there were three huge skips which were full of plaster work and panelling and ironwork and bits of, of ceiling. And the Ukrainian foreman says to my brother, you know what, you're in perfect timing, we've just ripped out all that shit. <laughs> it's perfect. And so I went and stood up in that on window in this void. Nothing left to touch and looked out across the chestnut trees towards the Black Sea. And I kind of wondered what to do. Do I go back even further to the shtetl, to the poor, tiny village where the family come from at the beginning of the 19th century? Do I go deeper into Odessa? What on earth am I doing? And I made a decision that I had to take Anetsuke back. I had to go home and I had to start writing the book. And that's what I did. Thank you very, very much. Well, um, I may have broken this. If I haven't, maybe you can hear me? Well, um, how do you follow that? I suppose the first thing is um, there's a room full of readers here. Um, Ireland is full of stories. You all got stories. Beat that one. <laughs> I mean, it is an incredible story. Um, I'm going to start. Um, I don't know what to say. I find it, it, it's, I suppose the thing about this is a beautiful book, but it's full of emotion. I think it's great the fact that we're all here because of the, the power of story and the power of emotion. There's a humi tremendous humanity in the book. And it, I think this book, without sounding corny or kind of Waltonish, <laughs> um, the book kind of brings out the best in us, the reader. And I think that's a, an incredible endorsement um, of Edmund de Waltz. <laughs> And a huge tribute to the way you've written this, the way you've told this and beautiful, strange, funny, and desperately sad story. I think the tribute to you is the fact that you've touched us. It, it, I, well, I'm... I'm going to have to look at you. The lights have come back. <laughs> so there are even more of you now than there were. <laughs> I, it's very, very, very... Diff There's a strange thing about writing about your family. No one asks, you, none of your family asks you to write about your family for a start. I mean, they really don't, because it's very dangerous. And it's dangerous for them, and it's very dangerous for you. And it's dangerous for you because how do you navigate honestly that territory? How on earth do you navigate that honestly? Um, and how do you shape it? I mean, there's, I have a horror of picking a book up opening it up and finding a family tree. I mean, that is the worst thing that you can ever do. And this is a family tree which has got three people with the same name in it over 150 years. So it's scary on that level, which is that it's a story across generations and across countries. But it's much, much, much more scary on the, on the, on the real level, which is that you are very undefended if you choose to write about your family. I think, too, um, uh, there's so many aspects to this, but um, I suppose I should say, um, I think it's an important point, particularly in the context of the council, of the conference. Um, when I opened um, the Jiffy bag that the book was in, um, I opened Jiffy bags, the um, padded envelopes, the books appear, and I open them all the time. I've been opening them for, I don't know, 25 years. I still um, i am excited every time I open a Jiffy bag. Um, I love looking at books. I love seeing what's inside you know, the, the envelopes. 
But when I saw this book, my first reaction was, what a beautiful book. And then my second reaction was, is that the Edmund de Waals? <laughs> because I knew your work. And um, that made it all the more exciting and strange. And um, there's Bernard Leach, the Potter's book. I've had the book since 1980. And um, Edmund's written a monograph of Bernard Leach. I mean, it's incredible, all these wonderful connections and the whole richness of that whole Central European thing and the fact that you came to your family story as an Englishman, yeah. the son of an Anglican priest, yeah. and you discover that you're a European Jew. Well, 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 well yeah. I mean, I, I, I couldn't be more English. You can probably tell. <laughs> can't, really def- can't really hide that. I'm quite English. Um, uh, really rather English. Rather English. <laughs> really rather English. <laughs> Sitting in Dublin Castle. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of cultural nuances here. So, <laughs> so there you go. Um, um, but do you know what? I really, really grew up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an Anglican, a, a, a Church of England, English environment. And, the, and the, one of the real imperatives, uh, you know, with Evensong and, and, you know, gowns and the whole lot, you know, the whole thing, mm-hmm. you know, a chapel in the house. Um, and the, 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 one of the reasons that, about the timing of the book is that my father is now in his mid-80s, but my father had never, ever, ever talked about his life before he came to England. And I, my grandmother had talked about it, my great-uncle had talked about it, my father had never talked about it at all. And I thought the only way I am going to get a conversation to happen with my father is to write a book. It's the only legitimate way I can ask him a question. And the only way I can get a conversation between my children who are growing up and their grandfather, Mm -hmm. who is growing old. So in some ways, the book, which is very very personal, is an attempt to get my father... And I say early in the the book, I think, right at the beginning, is I I asked my dad for some help. And he said, well, there's really nothing. (laughs) I don't have anything. And he comes down to my studio with a Sainsbury's bag with some Thomas Mann books in it and says, well, that's all I've got. And then he comes down with a few, a few photographs and says, well, that's the family archive. Um, you're now the inheritor of the family archive. And it's, it's like a manila envelope. That's it. And, and then it was just that astonishing thing about cadence, I suppose, that I say to him, well, I've been in Paris um, looking at, at Impressionists. And he says, do you know what? In 1934, we used to go to, when we were living in Paris, I used to go to the Jeux de Pomme with my mother and our nurse, and I remember seeing, you know, and then I'd say, and I'd been in Vienna recently, and he'd go, and I was just walking down past the university to to, to the the park beyond, and he said, there was a man there who used to sell ice creams, um, and it was was the only way that it could happen Mm -hmm. was to do this ridiculous journey Mm -hmm. and then talk with him, and the things that emerged... Were, were real, um, and that's the way it happened. It did begin a conversation with him, and now he's in his 80s, and he is very, not because of the book, but because of where he is in his life, he's very much more open and alive to his, the fact that he's Jewish. Yeah, but your, your grandmother, Elizabeth, she mm. had been very important in te- she was a storyteller. She was an incredible storyteller. I mean, she was completely... She was, you, she was scary in the right way for a grandmother, which is that she really cared. I mean, she... I mean, I did occasionally get letters corrected and sent back to me with sort of... <laughs> but but she, she made an assumption that some things mattered. And one of them was, was literature. I mean, she... She'd had this great correspondence of Rilke, which is pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and she knew her Proust inside out. And her, you know, in her flat in Tunbridge Wells, you know, was this, was, was European literature from top to, from the ceiling to the floor. But she told stories. 
and I'm convinced, this is my theory of the day, that, that, that it's not every generation, but most generations, generations, there's always someone who's listening to family stories. This is probably worth trying this out in Dublin, actually, about family stories, but there's, there's someone who's listening, and it's not obvious who it's going to be in any generation, but that stories do get t passed on in kind of zigzaggy ways. I don't know, it's like complete bullshit, never mind. We'll move mm. on from that. But anyway, mm. she did tell me a lot of stories. Mm. But she was this quiet, clever girl with the incredibly glamorous, elusive mother. Um, so it was almost like she became a watcher early in life. And it's this thing of, of um, the Nitsi, you kind of think of them as the witness, that this kind of a, a communal, yeah, you know, this a chorus in the sideline uh, watching. Yeah? It, 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 it's, it's really mm. difficult to talk about objects mm. um, and not anthropomorphize them or... or, 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 or it's very, it's, it's dangerous territory because you can't, you know, their objects are objects. They have been in places where things have happened. Um, you know, and so in that sense, they are witness, they are witnesses. And there are, you know, the extraordinary thing that, that objects that have been held, touched, handled, passed on have a particular feel to them. Mm. And it's very difficult to talk about that. I mean, there is a sort of pattern and a warmth to these objects mm. because they have been in people's hands for 200 odd years and in such interesting places at that. Including a mattress. Including a mattress, yeah. and especially a mattress. Yeah. But, but, but it's difficult, you know, I, there, there, been, there have been some really bad books where people have tried to tell stories through objects. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sure we can all think of them. <laughs> but. You know, and it's dangerous territory because you can't, you mustn't, you, mu you know, how, how do you get that story around objects to work? Because objects really do matter. And also places and space. And I suppose the, the sheer breadth of it, when you think of Victor, born in Odessa, and he dies in Tunbridge Wells. Yeah. I mean, yeah. right across yeah. Europe, yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, and, 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 and he's born in Odessa, yeah. and he, he thinks that he's going to live in Vienna forever. Yeah. You know, he makes this library. Yeah. You know. Anyway, yeah. In in the writing of it, I, I think there's so many qualities to it. The fact that you tell the story, like the artist's eye is there. Mm. Um, but it, in, in the, 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 there is a distance, a detachment, a kind of the curiosity. You're very much the detective. Um, you you were able to keep the emotional. It, it's 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 profoundly moving. But it's not um, saccharine well, 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 or cloying. But well, mm. the one point mm. I think is, of all the extraordinary sequences in the book, it's the, um, the terrible moment when you have to reimagine what it was like when the Gestapo... Firstly, mm. there's the warning signs. Mm. The people, we don't, you're Jewish and we don't like you. So the anti-Semitism begins to kind of really um, filter through. But then we have the Gestapo coming in and you create, you reimagine what it was like when they came crashing in and destroyed the lives, mm. humiliated... Mm. Y your forebears, and uh, you, you say that this is the point where you weep. Yeah. I mean, uh, how, I mean, the historians here, yeah. um, you have written hi history, yeah. a history, a story yeah. that we know, yeah. but you have reimagined this history again from a personal level. What was that, the pain and the grief and the anger, and the anger's in the book? Oh, it's very, yeah, yeah? I, I'm, I'm, but, 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 I mean, um, if, if, if you're going to write, I, I cared about these people. You know, I, I, I really, really cared about them. I, I you know, I, I, I uh, and, and therefore there is that huge responsibility, narrative responsibility to, 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 to be in that place fully. Um, and the thing is that so many people have written about it who were there, you know, uh, and written about it was brilliantly. And so it felt like hubris to be writing about it, but I had to write about mm -hmm. it. And someone said to me, some, some bastard said to me, how could you be so detached? You know, what, what, what didn't you feel? I mean, that's the only way I could write that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. How, how on earth could I not write it in that way? Yeah, yeah. Because if I, if, if, I, if, I was, if I was emoting in it, yeah. you know, yeah. you'd, 
you know, you, you, you put the book down and you run away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet it's all the more moving because of that detachment, but that is the moment when, the, when your anger, your yeah. expected and obvious yeah. and, and, you know... But, but the anger is, the anger yeah. is yeah. that you have to say, yeah. you know, every sing that's the weather was like that mm -hmm. on March the 17th. Yeah. And the newspaper says on March the 18th that, you know, Aryan toothbrushes are now for sale. Yeah. And that on March the 19th, yeah. you know, that the, every single Jewish lawyer loses their job mm -hmm. and in the afternoon. I mean, that's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. That's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. That's the way I did it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, can we talk uh, about the next bit? I'm sorry, okay. I kind of very... <laughs> <laughs> we just we'll step yeah, backwards yeah, yeah. then to... Um, there's this, that the ease and the glamour of, of, of Charles and the fact that it really is a young man yeah. on the loose with yeah. incredible wealth in a beautiful city yeah. with, um, and his own imagination and his response to these things. Yeah. Like he's in, a, in this mm. dream environment yeah. for somebody who's interested in the arts. But it's a, it's a great moment. I mean, yeah. and, 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 you know, when I started this, mm. this whole thing and um, I thought, how on earth am I going to like this man? He's mm -hmm. just horribly rich. Privileged. <laughs> Privileged. Yeah, yeah. You know, how, yeah. uh, and, then, and then reading him and seeing, you know, I tried to track down all his paintings and go and actually look at them. Yeah. Madness. Um, but actually standing in front of his pictures and thinking, why, why did he buy that? You know, that? And then finding that he'd written about them and then reading his book on Dürer yeah. um, and seeing how alive he was yeah. and how he grew through this art. Um, and grew through conversation. And then, and then, and then, and then, of course, this astonishing thing, which is that he turns out to be Swan. He turns up in Proust. Yeah. He turns out that yeah. Proust is his secretary and comes to his apartment and looks at his paintings, and Charles's paintings t start turning up in, in Proust's writings, and yeah. Proust comes to his parties, and, and then Charles Ephrussi becomes Charles Swan. And so there's that yeah. astonishing kind of layering of, of people and place yeah in that way too. Now, the, 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 the danger, the, 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 the real danger of that was that I could, I, I could still be writing about Belle Epoque Paris yeah. uh, and it would have been sort of a hyperventilating Englishman writing about ball gowns and, <laughs> and, 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 and Proust and, and, and opera. Uh, and I would still be, I'd write, go on writing for another 20 years and it would just be schmaltzy, nostalgic waffle. Yeah. So but I had to stop. The I had collection to, move on, so, yeah, so yeah, does your yeah. story. Yeah, so I had yeah. to, so I had to, kind, yeah. of, I had to yeah. kind of, yeah. you know, and I think the, 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 the way, the, the, the fact was that there was all that, but it was also against the backdrop of the Dreyfus affair. So yes. that, there, was the, that there was this glamour, but it was shot through with this fault line yeah. of, of anti semitism And, and, and I... I thought I, you know, I'd done my history A level. I thought I knew about the Dreyfus affair, but it's yes. appalling. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely. Uh, sorry, I mean you're all historians, I, but it's appalling. Yeah. It's yeah. appalling. It's appalling. And it, and it, and it, and and the things that are said there and tried out in Paris prefigure yeah. German anti-Semitism, yeah. Austrian anti-Semitism. It's yeah. a it's a public yeah. rehearsal yeah. for where Jews belong in 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 in. in Western society. It's very, very, very complicated. Yeah. There's a brilliant book by Ruth Harris on Dreyfus that came out last year. Yeah. Really good book. But even the, the fact that um, Charles' life is, is running parallel with um, the reality of French social history that Zola yeah. was writing yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and yet, at the same time, um, th this is the way uh, fate determines people's lives. Yeah. And, you don't have to make a great claim for Charles because it's there yeah. when he dies how distressed everyone yeah. is because yeah. he was loved. Yes. yes. So that's it's the simple statement. Yeah. He was very, very popular, very yeah. much loved. Yeah. So one, one, yeah. one of one yeah. of the most peculiar after effects of this book is um, yeah. is having letters. I got had lots of very moving letters from people who've had parallel stories about diaspora. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole pile of letters which go. You may not know this, but I am your cousin. Um, because uh, there are quite a lot of quite complicated love affairs in Paris in the 1870s. <laughs> so I've been having these letters, which go into a different pile called family question mark, question mark, <laughs> where going, we share, as it happens, a great, great... <laughs> so it's very, very rather, rather fun. <laughs>
When, um, for you though, as this very, well, rather, rather very kind yes. of sort of English, Englishman, yeah. um, <laughs> with a choice of being rather sort of kind of French yeah. or maybe yeah. kind of a bit sort of yeah. Viennese, I mean, do you find yourself gravitating, and let's not forget the Russia's there in the background yeah, yeah. too, I mean, is there a place that you naturally gravitate towards? I mean, the, the style, I, I, your style, I, your, your ceramicist style is very much, that, that, there's that sense of Japanese design yeah. as well, so it's kind of complicated, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've, it kind of made sense of, of, of sort of the, the journey made sense of my kind of diasporic kind of, you know, the fact that I love, I'm always sort of on the move, I guess, in one way. Um, but I'm a potter, you yeah. know, and, I, and I'm a very grounded potter. I have a studio in London and I sit down and I make pots and you mm -hmm. can't move, I, I don't move around, I make pots in that place. And, mm -hmm. and so there's a, um, um, I always come back to, 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 to my life as a maker. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, 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 book, which has derailed my life, um, um, hasn't stopped me being a potter. It's actually opened up other ways in which the kinds of things I now want to make mm -hmm. in some ways the, reflect some of the story yeah, of the book. Like the, the motif of um, collection yeah. and gathering chorus. Yeah. Um, the communal voice. Yeah. Um, you can see that with the pots, the stand, these, these installations with the group yeah. standing, they're standing yeah. along ledges yeah. in galleries as witness. And that motif of witness yeah. is so important. And, and memory. And, I, I, yeah. you know, and I, I, when I was trying to finish the book, I'm finding it very, very difficult and writing what I found very, very painful and complicated bit right at the very end of the book, mm. which was really about whether I should write the book or not. <laughs> not. There was a real moment when I wondered whether to just walk away. Mm -hmm. I was also trying to finish a, um, a commission for the V&A mm -hmm. in London mm -hmm. for the ceramics galleries, and it's up high in a dome. It's mm -hmm. a red ring, which has got 450 pots up. Mm -hmm. And they're really, really high up. Yeah. And I finished the book, and the book was published, and I, was, I suddenly realized that I'd made... <laughs> I'd made an installation of pots that can't be moved, can't be touched, can't be got rid of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can't, be, can't be dispersed, uh, can't, there's no diaspora about those pots, they're mm -hmm. memory and they're there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, that's stupid, but that's no, true. But I mean, of, it's um, just how I, it was all yeah, working out for me. You mean, you think of uh, uh, permanence and mobility um, whether you stay in the place or whether you move, yeah, um, yeah. survival is really the theme. Yeah. I suppose the little yeah. objects are survivors. Yes, yeah? yes. So quite and but but yeah. what's really, really interesting is that, and I still hope they're in the room. <laughs> the doors are locked. <laughs> um, is that they are absolute survivors. Mm -hmm. but, I, but, but, but what's the irreducible thing is not the objects, it's the fact, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the story. Um, and they're handed together, yeah. and it's trying. The book is trying to unpack, yeah. unpack the story from the objects. But it's very, 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 very interesting because um, the story is not is is obviously about the things I could find, but it's absolutely about the things I couldn't find. It's about silences all the way along. It's about silences. Each generation of people being silent about their Jewishness in particular places. It's about silences about where you come from. It's about where you, who you are. And like some of the paths, I mean, in Victor, Victor's journey yeah. was remarkable. It was very long and very painful. Um, Emmy commits suicide yeah. at, 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 yeah. at the, at the, vacation, the, the, fam, the holiday house, yeah. which was always associated yeah. for her yeah. with, yeah. with liveliness yeah. And, yeah. and fun. And then yeah. that's actually where she chooses to die because she's had yeah. enough. But some of the other members of the family, you can't trace them. The path runs cold. So I'm yeah. wondering, do you yeah. feel, I mean, are, these, are they ghosts or are they part of you? I mean, who, the, the, this, you, you love these people that you never met. You, you came to love them through a journey. Yes. So how do, you, how do you feel about them? Why do you make us love these people that you never met, but they're part of you? Because I suppose, yeah. if I'm really honest, I am a writer as well as a reporter. Mm. There, I've said it in public. It's the first time I've ever said that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> she made me. She made me do it. 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 publicly, we all knew it before we came in. It doesn't mean I have to write anything else, but I've, but I've said it now. But but it's it's. Mm. The thing is, what, what, what's revealed and what's hidden, and, mm -hmm. what, and what you choose to hide and what you mm -hmm. choose to reveal. I, just, 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 just one, one story, mm -hmm. one story, which is about this, which is that about Englishness and about Jewishness, which is that, that when we were growing up in, in Canterbury, it's a, it's a, you know, in the, mm -hmm. next to the cathedral, yeah, yeah. and it, the, the, all the deans of Canterbury since the Reformation have had their portraits painted. Okay. And so there are all these portraits in the house, big gilt portraits. So my father's there and has been there for five years. And then they say to him, you've got to have your portrait painted. He says, fine. So he says, I'm going to have my portrait painted by my cousin, Viennese cousin, Marie Louise von Montaschitsky, who mm -hmm. lives in Hampstead, refugee, known him since he was a boy. She's done in her 80s. And so he, Marie Louise says, of course, Tasha, that was the patronymic, of course, Tasha, of course I'll paint your portrait. And one condition that no one sees the portrait until it's unveiled. That's fine. So there we are, a family, dean and chapter, archbishop, portrait, red velvet thingy, you know, over it. Yeah. And they say, and, and they pull it off, the, the, the red curtain off, and Mary Louise has painted my father as a rabbi. <laughs> And, 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 she, and, and, and she says to him, you're a, you're, you're a Church of England yeah. clergyman, but you're yeah. still a Jewish boy. Yeah. And it's an amazing portrait. Yeah. He's there as a rabbi. Yeah. And there was silence. It's, this portrait's still in the deanery. It's a great, great portrait of my father. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, that, uh, and, that's, and that's absolutely about identity. You know, and that's that's about the silences and the and and, and you know, in any etc. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you all want to ask questions. They may not want to. They may not. Want to. <laughs> Could we have? Um, there's a microphone down there. Is there another book? <laughs> if, if, I'm, if I'm honest, and I seem to be only being honest tonight, <laughs> um, there's a book that I absolutely want to do. I can't work out how to do it. I can't work out about the voice in it. So it's about five years away. Uh, but yes, there is another book. There is another book. Um, it's a book about memory. I was just going to yeah, ask you. you that um, it seems a terrible personal question to ask you, but I'm afraid your your, your memoir I, is I, I, personal. I, I, I can't see you. Oh, I'm here. Wait, can you stand up? I can't. I can't talk to someone. I can't Hello? see. Hello. Um, can you? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, about your father's response to ha how the book is, is is out in the world. Just if if it's not too personal. No, 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 no. I, I, I um, um, he's he's terribly pleased. He's as bemused as I am. <laughs> But I have, there's one other, sorry, just on that, there's one other thing, which is I did say to him and mm -hmm. to my uncle um, th that they could read it in proof, and if either of them object objected to anything in the book, I'd take it out. If they objected to the book, mm -hmm. I would pay back my pathetically small advance, <laughs> and it wouldn't be published. And my uncle rang me up and said, I have to meet you. And I thought, oh. oh no. <laughs> And he said to me, there's a problem. And I went, oh, okay. He said, on page 232, you say in the Tyrol where we were living in exile that there was a cacophonous village band. I was the conductor of that band. <laughs> and it was very, very good. <laughs> so I bought him a wonderful bottle of wine and he's, it's kept, it's still in the book. <laughs> Um, yes? Um, I was interested in the relationship in the book between your family and wealth, and, and also um, poverty, the yeah. Stadtl, where, yeah. you, where you came from. Yeah. How, how did you make sense of that yourself? Um, 
well, I'm completely unenamored of mm -hmm. huge wealth. You know, I've been and stood in those houses and felt how mausoleum-like they are, you know. And what was very, very interesting is that the generation, the diasporic generation, the four children who got out of Vienna and lived as refugees in England and Mexico and America and Japan, all started again their lives with absolutely nothing, with no nostalgia at all, and had that sense of liberation from the great wealth. Now, I, you know, I, that's, not a, that's not a comment on anyone else's experience of being in exile or a refugee or whatever. It's just their experience, which was that actually they made their lives very fully without it. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, the, for me it's very, very important that the book was a, 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 an, an anti, a tract against nostalgia and a tract against melancholia. And it's absolutely not one of those books which is sort of saturated and dusted with sort of icing sugar. Um, because the shtetl is absolutely there, was absolutely there. I, th I think it's interesting too, that thing about wealth and, and poverty, is that when you go to Odessa and yeah. the only thing that's left is the balustrade, yeah. and again, the artist's eye, the eye that sees things that the rest of us don't, but um, you see the blackened motif, yeah. the, um, the ear of wheat on which the family wealth had been, the, grain, mm. the grains from, from the Ukraine, that's where the money had come from, from, from the wheat fields. Yeah. And I think it's incredible that this, well, ostentatious, yeah. opulent sort of Bling. lifestyle, yeah. yeah, these massive kind of palaces, yeah. but it's all, it's all um, tracks back to, yeah. to wheat. You know, I think that's quite interesting, the connection between the two. I mean, I really wouldn't mind a day gap. I really, really wouldn't mind a day gap. I mean, I'm not, so, I'm, I'm not, I'm not stupid, but, 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 there's, but there's something very, very real yeah. about not having it, mm -hmm. and that doesn't transform into nostalgia. you can't hear me, yeah. you, you, you deliberately don't go down the road of trying to find your family's well, artistic wealth. No, no, do, well, do, do you know what? This is really, really important. This is so important mm. because I, restitution is incredibly significant. Mm. It's, incre it's about loss. It's about, it's about theft. It's about effacing families and erasing them and states and museums and collectors just... Mm. just refusing to admit to, 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 to the 20th century. So I'm a huge and passionate supporter in restitution. But what I chose to do was to restitute my family's story in a book. Now, I have absolutely no... I, I, that's my thing. I've got brothers. If they want to, you know, if they want to go and argue with Viennese lawyers about... Oh, there are paintings in Viennese museums that, that, that we could battle to get back and that's fine that's up to them but what this uh, this book is coming out in Austria in the autumn and I think that's my bit of restitution you know I I, I um, yes down there I see a sleeve <laughs> Um, I think uh, your three children, I think, dedicated to the beginning book, one of them is called Anna, isn't she? Yes. Mm -hmm. The heroine, mm -hmm. the, the non or the Gentile heroine of the book, yeah. is that correct, mm. do you think? She's called Anna. Mm. She's yeah. called Anna. Mm. Well, that's a wonderful tribute yeah. to, uh, yeah. to that obviously amazing woman. I, do you know what? I, 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 um, I have absolutely no doubt mm -hmm. that when I'm in Vienna in October, that a week after it's published, someone is going to come up to me and say, Vienna is, is tiny. Someone is going to come up to me and say, that's my great aunt, that's my cousin, that's my, I, I, I have absolutely, I have Could you adamantine, that yeah. adamantine yeah. knowledge yeah. that that's what's going to happen. Because you were saying that you, I asked you about that, yeah. you said, but maybe yes, yeah. no, yes, well, yes. But it, it, the awareness is there. I mean, and she's, 
and you have this note of regret that you don't know her last name, you know nothing about her. So you just know her name was Anna. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I didn't want to, imp I didn't want to lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to go and, you know, and make up some... Yeah. Anyway. Which is the way her name is lost. It's, it's just what happens. It's, it's, it's really happens. very true. It's what it's happens. What happens. It really it, is about. Yeah. It's so much about life. Yeah. The story, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um. Um, my compliments on the book. A fabulous read. Um, I, I got you. the impression that if anybody had was to write this book, it should have been Iggy. But uh, he renounced his uh, background, his Jewishness, and I notice on the stone uh, there's no. Jewish symbol. Mm -hmm. um, how how did his background sit with him? He 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 was so Jewish. <laughs> you have never met. He was fully fully Jewish. It's interesting. There's no Jewish symbol on the on on their gravestone. Um, it's in you know and and he planned his Buddhist funeral. Um, but my God, he knew what he was giving me. You know, he really did. And even though I, I... When I was there at his funeral, I hadn't planned to say it. I said the Kaddish for him there. And I know that he would have been very, very, very pleased about that. He wrote terribly. You know, he couldn't have written the book. <laughs> <laughs> he loved... He loved... He, his idea of a really good read was Frederick Forsyth. Um. <laughs> he really, really... Do you know, I know he had all the proofs up there. I, know, I don't think he ever got through the first volume. <laughs> We're just... Another, um, hello, yes? Hello, I just want to ask about the Netskis today. Yes. Do your children get a chance to line up all the rats in a row and kennel the dog and so on? Yes, yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I'm... I'm slightly chary of, of, of talking too much about them because it's their story. I, can't feel, I feel that's crossing their threshold mm -hmm. for them. They, they're a, I, do you know what? Yes, is the answer. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to have, a, in my old age, I'm going to have a misery memoir <laughs> from my children about how they were forced to play with the Netscape. Like but, you know, um, 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 you know. But, but do you know what? They really... I, it's very extraordinary because... Um, you know, there is, th which is that thing about how big they are in the hand. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they're so small mm -hmm. when, you hand, when, when you hand them around and you see them in a child's hand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're so big. And it's such a basic thing. <laughs> but, but it's so moving. It's so moving. Thank you for that. Um. Uh, hello. Hi. I'm halfway through the book, so uh, I'm really, I, really enjoying it. I, I, I so I know what I'll be doing when I go home this evening. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you very much, but I have a question. Um, yeah. As a linguist myself, I'm interested in, first of all, you know, when you're in France, yeah. in Paris, yeah. and you're going to the archives, yeah. and you're obviously reading yeah. with facility French language, yeah. Yeah. you then go to Vienna, and you're reading in German. Mm, and well, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'll, yeah. And um, mm. I mean, I'm at the section where Elizabeth is looking to be um, schooled as her brother, yes. and you know, yeah. she and yeah. you, you describe how in the family they spoke with ease, yeah. you know, at least three languages. And I'm wondering if that is part mm. of your inheritance. No, no. Do you know what this is? This is, makes me so cross. Not your question. Your question is brilliant, <laughs> but but because my, this is completely mm. classic that I'm the child of a refugee. My father speaks five languages. His mother spoke seven languages, plus obviously Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, um, and Yiddish. Um, you know, obviously. Uh, but that's growing up yeah. with this def yeah, defiantly yeah. English man. All I hear is English. So no, I, I can read read French. I speak French appallingly badly. I, I stumble through German and I had to have quite a lot of help with German. Yeah. So my Japanese is all right, but I Japanese, kind of, but, yeah. but, I, but the, um, no, I'm terrible at languages. I've got brothers who are good at languages, but yeah. um, no, I don't, I haven't, I, one of my youngest brother, Tom, has inherited yeah. this ridiculous polyglot thing, which I'm really envious about, yeah. a bit about being in, at home across languages, yeah. which is yeah. really interesting. But I had to struggle, had to struggle with that. I have to say that the most, I have, 
Um, I know we're running late, but um, <laughs> just very briefly. Um, the book came out in, in Paris in, in um, March, and I had to go and do um, press there, um, which was fine, and it all was very nice, and, and et cetera, except for an extremely cross, incredibly svelte, Parisian, tiny Parisian journalist. And she said to me, OK, you're English, and you're writing about Proust. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Did you? Yeah. Mean? I went, well, I, 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 I think and she, met you know, her. you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was a level of offence there, yeah. which I think <laughs> I will treasure. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is... Uh, one question. Sorry? Just one more question at the end. Yeah. The actual, the objects themselves, what's their original purpose or oh, origin sorry. or something? Do you know what? Um, actually, I would, it would be possible if they could gently come back to me. Which I'd be very grateful <laughs> for before any more gentlemen leave the... Where are they? He's gone. He's gone. <laughs> um, well, if I... Stop that, man. Are they? Are they, are they? OK, here's one. Um, what happens is, if you, if you notice, there were two... Um, OK, there's one. OK. The, 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 basically, a cord, a sash goes... Go, a, 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 there, a sash goes through them, a cord goes through them, so they actually hang as toggles, and, and they, they close up a sort of little brocade bag that you, or, a, in, or, or a, a, a lacquer or a cloisonné little box that you'd have on your belt. And they're mostly used they were, uh, for, Kimonos, by, by, yeah. for kimonos, yeah, and it would be merchants or scholars or, or, or samurai. So they're kind of, they almost have the kind of, um, um, the sort of cultural, like a beautiful watch that you might produce from your from your waistcoat, you know, uh, waistcoat pocket. You know, something very beautiful that could be handled. But again, something I think is very interesting is that y you make uh, art, beautiful things. Mm. It's the you know the craftsman as mm. artist. Mm. You know, I mean, and these are crafted pieces and they're uh, functional yeah. and practical. So I think, and why, w what place is more fitting than an international um, yeah. craft conference yeah. in which it's so important to acknowledge the craftsman is the artist. Yeah. Artists may not always be craftsmen, but the best craftsmen are actually artists. And I think this thing is very important. It will be addressed yeah. tomorrow, yeah. no doubt, yeah. by the various speakers, and but it's terribly important for And the other thing, great yeah. thing about, about, yeah. about craft, of course, is, 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 is the fact that obj and mm. about objects, mm. is, of course, that objects are always on the move. I mean, that's the... Do you know, I'm going to get really professorial. I'm going to shut up, actually, about that. I really am. I'm going to... Oh, I've got the third. Thank you so much for your... For your... <laughs> A journey across Europe, a journey to Japan and back to Europe, to, to England, yeah. and quite a, quite a tricky journey in a room in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you ha I have to say, I, you've been the most generous generous, generous audience I've ever had. So I'm hugely grateful. Oh. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.